the study that I completed is, is all about lostness in Kentucky. Lostness is, is everywhere, and, uh, and we need to do what we can, working together, partnering together as Kentucky Baptists to penetrate that lostness. And that study testifies to the fact that there's lostness all over our state. When the study came out and, and began to reveal how deep the lostness is, it, it, it burdened my heart uh, even more for this region to know that 21 out of the 25 most lost counties are all in, in Appalachia. Uh, just, just really burdened my heart for this, this region that I was born and raised in. And, uh, and so I've had the opportunity to come back and serve here. Uh, but uh, it truly gave me a, a broken heart for uh, this part of our state that uh, uh, there's so much lostness and there's so few churches in this region and so there's just such a need for new Kentucky Baptist churches all over Eastern Kentucky. We're beginning to see some of the fruits of that with Multiply East Kentucky and uh, some other initiatives that are taking place. We're beginning to see churches such as Creekside Church be planted uh, in other parts of our state. I think there's somewhere around seven or eight different church plants in the works just in the east and for that I praise the Lord but uh, we need so many more, and that's why I'm grateful that the Eliza Broadus offering helps us plant many more gospel-believing, gospel-proclaiming churches in eastern Kentucky and all throughout the state. Well, if you're blessed today, say amen. 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 What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord on this Thursday. So we're looking forward to a great uh, time of worship in, in our chapel service uh, today. Looking forward to uh, the singing that we're going to have and be able to lift up praises to the name of our Lord. He's worthy, isn't he? Yes. Amen to that. And so it's also great to have Brother Andy McDonald uh, with us today. Um, he is a church evangelist strategist for the Kentucky Baptist Convention. He's no stranger to our campus. He preached here uh, last uh, semester, and so we're, we're thankful um, for him, looking forward to hearing him bring the Word of God. And I understand that we also have some other guests uh, with us today, uh, Randy McDaniel and his wife, Alicia. Y'all stand up for just a moment, wave at everybody. There you go. And then Nick Hedges, uh, he's here with his pastor, Doug. Doug's an alumnus of here. We're thankful for them. Let's give them a Clear Creek welcome today. <clears throat> Let's see, Mark Sonnemeyer, are you, you here, brother? I think you're going to pray for us. So you come and and pray, all right? Amen to that. And then as he prays, Matthew, you, you come, bring the team, lead us in worship. Um, actually, this is news to me. I didn't even ask for praying this morning. But um, I know Miss Sanders had set out a, a prayer request for a um, for a lady whose friend was hate. She had a car accident with several um, with the neck injury and several other injuries, and also just remember the Sanders family in your prayers. They're going through a lot at their family right now. So uh, let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, come to you this morning. God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for the blessing it is to get to be here on this campus and in this chapel service this morning. God, I pray that um, that you would come meet with us here. God, I pray that um, that you would watch over our service. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word and sing your praise this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We'll stand with me this morning. Let's declare praise to the lion and the lamb this morning. Broken hearts declare his praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, his blood breaks
Give the lion and the lamb praise this morning, church. Thank you, God. Thank you.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be about a statement that I made to the worship team this morning about how when we're singing, Scripture tells us in Zephaniah, I believe it is, that God sings over us, that He is singing. The God of the universe is a singing God. So if you ever stand there and think, I'm not a good voice, I, I can't sing, the God of heaven is singing over you. If the God of heaven is singing over you, then you should want so badly to sing out to him for all that it's worth, to be still in his presence and to know that he is God. So today, as we pray, as we come to this altar, I pray that we will think about those in our lives that need to know that truth, that our God is not just standing there. He is singing and declaring over us who we are, that we are children of the one true king. So this morning, join me as we pray. They're sitting, standing, or coming to the altar. Pray with me now. Great. 
Heavenly Father, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, that our souls can take rest in you. That no matter what we're going through this morning, God, that you and you alone have us in your hands. And that our soul can find rest in that. So Lord, help us rest now, Lord, in your word that you're about to bring to us, God. Let your Holy Spirit rest on our speaker, Lord. Let him speak with a fresh fire of anointing. And help us declare as we leave this place today that no matter what you have in store for us, Lord... It is well with our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It is well with my soul. Soul, it is well. Sometimes we need to preach to ourselves, don't we? Soul, it is well. That's what that song's helping us to, to remember. Sometimes we need to preach to ourselves. I'll finish preaching sometimes and... I'll be driving along somewhere and go, you're a terrible preacher. What are you doing up there? Some of you all may conclude that after I'm done this morning as well. Uh, if you could just keep that to yourself, that'd be fine with me. But... <laughs> or find a constructive way to say it. And then the Lord just reminds us, hey, you're mine. I called you to this. And sometimes we need to preach to ourselves. Uh, remind, us, uh, uh, remind ourselves who we are in Christ uh, and who he is to us. I remember hearing this story, I, I think it's just one of those made-up stories, but uh, it might have happened. It, uh, it took place at a major university where uh, it's one of those classes where it's a freshman level class, there's like 300 in the class. I, I never was in a school that size, I'm grateful. I went to a little Bible college up in Michigan, uh, grateful for that opportunity. Uh, but it's one of those big universities, big classes, and, and there was a a senior in there, this was his last class, he was taking his last final, uh, and he had waited to take this class and put it off, and uh, he needed, to, he needed to, to, to be able to pass this class in order to graduate, or he wasn't going to graduate, and he, did, he needed to pass this final exam in order to pass the class so that he could graduate. So he gets into the final exam, the professor said, you've got 50 minutes to take the exam, not a minute more, when I call done, bring the tests up. Uh, and then you'll be dismissed. And so uh, he started to take the test, this young man, and he, he procrastinated. He'd kind of done a lot of that in his college career, maybe like some of you, like I, I did often, uh, more times than I care to admit in, in, in my uh, college career. But he tried his best. He was writing feverishly, and at 50 minutes, the professor called time. He said, bring the tests up. And uh, everybody brought their tests up, but this young man, and Five minutes later, six, seven minutes later, he's still writing. And ten minutes later, he comes walking up and he tries to hand his test into the professor. And the professor said, young man, I said 50 minutes. 
It's now been 60. I can't accept your test. And, and the young man said to him, sir, you don't understand. Uh, I, I need to pass this class, and if I don't pass this test, I'm not going to pass this class. If I don't pass this class, then I don't graduate. So would you please just make an exception for me? Young man, I said 50 minutes, not a minute more, and you've gone over the time, and I cannot accept it. The student started to get a little bit angry with him. said, sir, you've got to take this test. I need to graduate. I can't. I've got to move on in my life. I, you've got to take it. And the professor started to get a little bit bristle, and, and he said to him, young man, do you know who I am? And the college professor, or the, the student said to him, do you know who I am? And the professor said to him, no, I don't. And the student reached down at that test, those stack of tests about midway, picked them up, put his test in the middle, slammed it down and said, good. And he walked out. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I am not recommending that any of you do that, okay? <laughs> now, if that's all you're going to remember from this whole sermon right now. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, in the scheme of things, a professor not knowing one of his students, and maybe that student sliding by with a test like that, maybe in the scheme, grand scheme of things, it won't be very consequential. But, but uh, remembering who we are in Christ is important. Uh, it's vitally important. It'll be vitally important to you and your ministry because I promise you, uh, those of you that are going to pursue ministry with your life, that uh, the enemy will move against you uh, in ways that you can't even begin to think about now in your life. And it will be important for you to remind yourself, to preach to yourself, it is well, soul, because of who Jesus is. I invite you to turn to, uh, in your copy of God's Word, to Mark chapter 2. And uh, we'll, be, we'll read a... A, a, a passage of scripture that is likely very familiar, probably to all of you, and um, and hopefully we can see it with with fresh eyes this morning, uh, as the Lord uh, would open to our understanding. Mark chapter two, we'll read the first twelve verses. And when he, that's Jesus, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there when Jesus was preaching the word? He was preaching the word to them. Verse 3, And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when, he, when, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this this what an amazing story of the power of jesus to heal a broken soul and as i see this passage i i think about how jesus in his ministry was constantly doing the unexpected if you know anything about mark's gospel i know many of you all do you teach here uh, and, and likely you've studied mark's gospel before you know it moves really quickly right mark doesn't have a birth narrative he doesn't talk about Jesus' birth. He just kind of starts with Jesus, the Son of God, and then he starts into John's, uh, the, uh, the Baptist ministry, and then Jesus' earthly ministry, and how Jesus was teaching with an authority that they had never heard before. Never heard anybody teach like Jesus. He didn't teach like the scribes taught. See, the scribes, they would teach. When they would teach, they would reference Rabbi so-and-so, who would reference Rabbi so-and-so about the passage. Jesus didn't need to reference Rabbi so-and-so. He understood the scriptures. He knew them. Uh, he, he spoke with an authority, a freshness about the word of God that they had never heard before. 
And Jesus, he would heal the, he would heal the sick. Uh, he would cast out demons. He had an authority to do that. They'd never seen anybody do the things that Jesus had done before. And so people were drawn to Jesus. Have you noticed that about Jesus? People are drawn to Jesus. When they can see who he really is, they, they want to be with him. And so crowds were coming to Jesus. Now, uh, no doubt some of them were motivated by, man, I heard this guy can do miracles. I want to see this guy do a miracle. Maybe they were treating Jesus, some of them, uh, more, more like a magician than the Messiah. Uh, but whatever their motivations, they were coming from all over to see this man named Jesus. And chapter 2 begins, the Lord it says he's at home. Probably Peter's home. We don't know that for sure. Jesus could have had a home there in Capernaum, but uh, likely at Peter's home. And, and, and he's preaching the word, and the house is packed. He's preaching, and folks are coming to hear him from far and wide. They want to hear a fresh word from God. And there comes on this scene four men, and they're carrying their, their paralytic friend. Now, we don't know the extent of the man's condition, but obviously he was not able to get himself to where Jesus was. But he, he had four friends uh, that cared about him enough uh, that they came carrying him on his mat to this house where Jesus was preaching. They wanted to get their friend to Jesus, believing that Jesus could do for him what nobody else could do for him. And so they walked up on the house, and they saw that it was packed. People were spilling out into the streets. Uh, there was no room to get him in through the front door or a window or any other way uh, conventionally. And so uh, they said, sorry, friend, we tried. We, 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 we can't get you in, and so maybe we'll try another day. And they took, they took him back. Is that what they did? No, not at all. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure you all were still tracking with me here this morning. You know, I've heard that if you were to take every student in chapel... Uh, all around the world, people that are, that are students and, and faculty that are in chapel in colleges all around the world, and if you were to take all of those that, are, that have fallen asleep in chapel and laid them end to end, I've heard they'd be a whole lot more comfortable. That's what I've heard. So. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I'm glad you all are still tracking with me on that. No, that's not what they did at all. They said, we got to get our friend to Jesus. And so in those days, the roofs were often flat, and it wouldn't be unusual for them to have a family to have a ladder or even a stairway to get to the top. And so they got their friend onto the roof. Uh, roofs were earthen, uh, and so they began to dig through this roof. And I can just imagine the scene inside as that first dirt clod falls, and then another, and then another, and then another. And pretty soon, there's a hole wide enough where they can lower their friend down. And they do. They, they lower their friend down to the feet of Jesus. Now, here's what everybody expected Jesus to do in that moment. They expected Jesus to heal the man. How many of y'all know that Jesus doesn't take his cues by what people expect him to do? Uh, Jesus wasn't swayed by the crowd. He wasn't wowed by the numbers. Uh, Jesus had an authority that was from heaven. And he was always doing the unexpected. And so Jesus said... The most unexpected things. Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. The sweetest words that anybody will hear from the lips of God. Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Do you remember when Jesus spoke those words to your heart and life? Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. If you're saved, you'll never forget when that happened for you. I pray you never get over it. I pray, students, I pray it never becomes commonplace for you, that place where you met Jesus. I pray that that will always be holy and sacred ground for you. And I pray that you'll always, when you're in a moment of uh, maybe discouragement, I hope you'll remember that time when Jesus spoke those words into your heart. Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. And I pray that out of the overflow of grateful hearts for what he did in that place, because when he did that in your life and when he did that in my life, our eternity was settled in that moment. And I pray you never get over it. And out of the overflow of grateful hearts because of what he did for you, that's how you need to proceed in ministry, brother or sister.
I'm so grateful for what Jesus did for me. I was 18 years old, man. Uh, I, was, I was as lost as lost could be. And God brought a series of men into my life from my junior year to my senior year of high school who talked to me about having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I was in 11th grade. And I, I, I was lost. I, I didn't care. I was selfish. I was a sinner. It was all about me. Uh, I was regularly using drugs and alcohol. I'm not proud of that, but that was the life that I was leading. So some friends and I in 11th grade, on April 1st, we decided we were going to skip school, and we drove to the University of Michigan campus. I'm from Dearborn, Michigan, and the University of Michigan campus is about 40 minutes away. And every year on April 1st, they had a thing there called the Hash Bash. Now, this was not an officially University of Michigan sanctioned thing, okay? Uh, it, I don't know how it got started, but what it, was, ba what it basically was was a couple thousand college students would gather in a common area, and many of them would smoke pot and act like idiots, basically. I mean, that's what it was, you know? And so there we were, high school kids. We thought, man, we're big stuff, partying with college students. And there was this guy walking from group to group. He was short, pinstripe, bibbed overalls, had a book in his hand. I figured out later, as I thought about it, that was a Bible. He walked up to our group, and he said, 60-second encounter. He said words to this effect. He said, guys, listen, God loves you. And Jesus died on a cross to prove that God loves you. But if you don't give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. Now, Jesus died so you wouldn't have to go there, but you need to know that's the truth. My friends started to laugh at him. And so I laughed at him too. But I got to tell you, my laughter was on the outside. Because on the inside, those words tore me up. I mean, I had no idea what was going on on the inside of me. As I reflect on my, my, my story and my testimony after I got saved, I, I came to realize that was the Holy Spirit of God convicting me of my sin and lovingly drawing me to the Father. Some people may say, well, isn't that sort of harsh for him to tell you that you're going to go to hell without Jesus? No, not at all. He was being loving towards me because I was all about me. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. And this man came and presented the gospel to me. Listen, I can't wait to get to heaven. That's the last time I saw that guy. I can't wait to get to heaven and find him and thank him for having the guts to be out there that day. Because as far as I could tell, he was the only Christian out there sharing a gospel witness. And it would take me about another month or another year and four months before I'd be saved. But God used that man in my life in significant ways. What an unexpected blessing. I had no idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ could change my life. But that guy did. He knew it could. And he was out there telling me about it. Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. See, Jesus understood that if all he did was heal the man's body, the man might live the rest of his life with an intact body and then die and go to hell. Because Jesus sees the greatest need of the human heart. And the greatest need of the human heart, despite whatever brokenness we might have in our physical bodies, the greatest need of the human heart is to have Him living on the inside of us, experiencing His forgiveness and Holy Spirit power in our lives. We need Jesus, don't we? And Jesus recognized that about that man. He recognizes that about all of us. We need Him and what He alone can do. Uh, Jesus is the solution to our sin problem. You know, uh, Luke tells the same story in, in chapter 5, and he said that there were religious leaders coming from all over Israel to hear this new rabbi, this upstart rabbi. Uh, they wanted to make sure uh, that he was towing the line, that he was uh, you know, spouting the company line when it came to uh, the faith and the Old Testament. And so when they heard Jesus... Uh, these Pharisees, these scribes, these teachers of the law, when they heard Jesus say, son, your sins are forgiven, they became indignant. Now, notice none of them really had the guts to say anything out loud, uh, but they thought to themselves, blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus knew what they were thinking. <laughs> 
By the way, he always knows, doesn't he? <laughs> he always knows what's on the inside of you and me, so we might as well just go ahead and take it to him. Don't try and hide it from him. He already knows. You need to give it to him, whatever that thing is. Uh, and so Jesus knew what they were thinking. Blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, in one sense, they're right, right? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here's where they were deadly wrong. What they didn't understand was that God the Son was standing in their midst and they totally missed that truth. The Messiah had come and they totally missed the truth that He was God's Son. And you know what? You can hear me preach and forget my name and you'll be no worse for wear. But if you forget Jesus, you're in trouble. You're in serious trouble. See, these guys, uh, they cared more about their power and their position and their prestige than they did about the fact that God's Messiah was standing in their midst. And he had authority to do exactly what he did. So Jesus, he asked the question, which is easier to say? Son, your sins are forgiven. Arise, take up your mat and go home. Jesus asked the question, which is easier to say? Now, uh, for man, they're equally impossible. But for God, they're equally easy. God, God can do both. Uh, and humans cannot do either. Uh, only God can heal a broken body. I still believe. I'm so grateful for doctors and nurses and hospitals and medicine and procedure. Grateful for every bit of that. But really, truly, only God can heal. Amen. Only God can can heal and there's no doctor on earth that was going to heal what was wrong with this man which is easier to say son your sins are forgiven or rise take up your mat and go home Jesus said to them so that you understand that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins I say to you rise take up your mat and go home and he did he got up, maybe, we don't know, maybe for the first time in his life, he got up and he walked out in plain view of everybody there. And the people said, we have never seen anything like this before. They were amazed. See, really the only right response to when God does a miracle in our lives is to just offer praise and worship to him. Now, you know, I don't know uh, if I've ever experienced a miracle of healing in my life. Uh, I don't. I, it would. It would be something that I, I wouldn't have been aware of, as far as I know. I've, I've had pretty good health all, all of my days. I'm grateful for that. Maybe the Lord did something in me I, I wasn't aware of. But maybe you have been healed uh, physically of something, and, and you knew it was the Lord uh, that did it uh, for you. Uh, but I'll tell you this: if you've experienced new birth in Jesus Christ. You've experienced the greatest miracle anyone will ever experience in this life. You don't need to wait for another one. You'll not have a greater miracle than that because in that moment, you went from death to life. <laughs> he transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. He made you a brand new creation in Christ. He made you now a minister of reconciliation, the Bible says. You are now Christ's ambassadors as if God is making his appeal through you. Uh, that is who you are now because you've experienced the miracle of new birth. Don't wait for a greater miracle than that one. You've already experienced it. He placed his Holy Spirit in you. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, God can use your life to share the gospel and see people get set free. The unexpected. You know, I think that Jesus is setting an example for you and I to follow. That if we're going to be used by Him in significant ways uh, in our lives, we're going to have to be willing to get out on a limb. We're going to have to be willing to do the unexpected sometimes. We're going to have to be willing to be used by God in ways that maybe even the people that are our closest supporters won't understand. How about four friends deciding we got to get our friend to the feet of Jesus even if it means ripping our neighbor's roof apart? 
Now, I'm not suggesting that you get a ladder and an axe or a saw and cut your neighbor, a hole in your neighbor's roof. I'm not suggesting you do that. But that's what it took for them to get their friend to the feet of Jesus. What are you willing to do to get the people that you know in your life that don't yet know the Lord? What are you willing to do to get them to the feet of Jesus? Well, I'm not really comfortable in sharing my faith. I love uh, J.D. Greer wrote a book called Gaining by Losing. And, and in that book, he said, he, he talks about members that will come up to him and say, Brother J.D., I, I'm just not comfortable in sharing my faith. And he said, I'll tell him, of course you're not. He said, sharing the gospel is two uncomfortable people talking about the most important thing on the planet. <laughs> we have to get over our lack of comfort, right? We have to ask the Lord, God, would you give me Holy Spirit courage to get out on a limb, Lord, to get out so far on that limb, Lord, where the only way this is going to work is if you do it, and that way you get all the glory for it. Lord, would you use me in significant ways? I believe everybody here wants God to use their lives in significant ways. I don't believe there's anybody here that your prayer is, Lord, I just want to sort of lead a mediocre life, not do real, really much with my life, and just hang out on the couch, eat Twinkies, watch some TV, some sports, and then die in my sleep, preferably, Lord, if you can take me that way. I don't believe anybody's desire here is to live that kind of life. I believe everybody here wants to live a life of significance. Well, what's it going to take? You're going to have to trust the Lord to lead you into some places that you're going to go, Lord... You got to take control here. I read the story about some missionaries uh, in the South American country of Suriname, and and uh, these were some missionaries uh, that had a burden for some some slaves that lived on an island just off the coast of Suriname, and and the slave owners would not allow these slaves to talk to any outsider, and so these missionaries burdened for uh, these slaves to hear the gospel sold themselves into slavery and they began to reach them for Christ radical sure but is God calling you and I to any less of a radical commitment to him now, I get it some of you all you know even coming to Bible college maybe some people in your life didn't they didn't understand that step. Uh, maybe, maybe you had parents or somebody like that who love you or well-meaning uh, who said, you know, well, you've got such an aptitude, though, for engineering. And well, why, don't you do, why don't you go that route and, and you know, make sure you've got a, a really high-paying job and you can sort of do ministry on the side, right? I don't know if that was anybody's experience here, but it, it wouldn't surprise me. Sometimes when you step out in faith, even the people closest to you may not understand it. But if God's calling you to do it, you got to do it. If you want to be blessed, if you want to experience His best for your life, if you want to be, be in on the greatest adventure of the Christian life, when God speaks to your heart, step out in faith and trust Him. Trust Him. Now, I love... Uh, what uh, Chuck Swindoll uh, says here at this point, if you find yourself at a place uh, where you're ready to leap into something unexpected for the Lord, uh, he has these filters that we should pass our decision-making through. I, I really appreciate them. Chuck Swindoll says, before you leap, make sure it's the Lord speaking, okay? Make sure it's the Lord speaking. Uh, make sure that there are no contradictions with Scripture. God will never contradict His Word when He speaks to you and I in our hearts. That's what the enemy does. That's not what God does. And then uh, make sure, Chuck Swindoll says, that your motives are unselfish and pure. Check your motives on this. And then he said, make sure that it won't hurt your testimony or someone else's testimony if you step out in faith to do this thing. If you pass a decision uh, that's weighing your, on your heart that you feel like the Lord may be leading you to do through these filters and it's still there, go for it. God's in it. Step out in faith. Believe Him for big things. He'll take care of you. You belong to Him. 
I love uh, the story of A.W. Milne. He was uh, A.W. Milne was a, uh, a one-way missionary. Anybody heard of the one-way missionaries? Uh, th- these were a group of missionaries from uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, and they were called one-way missionaries because when they would get ready to leave for the mission field, uh, they wouldn't pack their earthy belongings in suitcases. They would pack what little earthly belongings they were going to take with them in a coffin, their coffin. Because if you were a one-way missionary, you weren't coming back. And A.W. Milne, a one-way missionary, passed all, packed all of his earthly belongings into his coffin, took off for the New Hebrides, the, an, an island chain, and, and went to a notorious people who had martyred every missionary who tried to come there before him. And he began to reach these people for Christ. And when he died, they put up a little plaque in the center of their village. And they said, when he came, there was no light. And when he left, there was no darkness. Wouldn't you want your life to be like that? Wouldn't you want people to be able to say that of you and me when you get to the end of your life? I believe everybody does. Well, guess what it takes? It takes that we would be willing. Lord, use me in unexpected ways. Now, sometimes the, uh, the, the Lord doesn't ask for permission. <laughs> the Lord doesn't just say, okay, I want you to think about this, pray about this, and I'm going to give you some time. To th-. Sometimes the unexpected comes into our lives, and we didn't ask for it. Sometimes the unexpected kicks the door open to our lives and says, I'm here. I think about when I was... Uh, serving in the United States Army many, many, many years ago. I was, I was stationed in Schweinfurt, West Germany. That tells you how long ago it was because it was still West Germany. Now there's one Germany, but th- then they were divided, East and West. I was serving in Schweinfurt, West Germany, which literally means pig town. I was in pig town, Germany, serving the United States Army. And uh, my battery commander, his name was Captain Stephen Kreider. And uh, he was a man's man. I mean, he was just chiseled and, and just a great leader, the kind of leader, man, that you'll run through a brick wall for. Anybody ever had a leader like that in your life? That was, that was Captain Stephen Kreider for me. And I knew a little bit about his story, uh, but there was a day where uh, we had loaded up our vehicles and we were getting ready to go out to the field and do army camping. I never enjoyed army camping, uh, but we were getting ready to go out and do army camping for several weeks. And so we had gotten to the train station. We were going to load up our vehicles on the trains. And uh, if, if you're familiar with the military, the, the phrase hurry up and wait is often used. So we hurried up to get there, and then we sat there waiting to load our vehicles. That happened a lot. And so Captain Kreider walked up to my vehicle, and he said, uh, Special McDonald, how are you doing? I said, Sir, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, he said, That's good. I said, Sir, I've heard a little bit of your story, but I sure would love to hear it all. And he said, okay. And he began to tell me the story. See, Captain Stephen Kreider in 1980 was ranked number two in the world in the javelin throw. He was going to represent the United States in the next Summer Olympic Games. Only a Russian was better than him, according to the rankings. He had trained for years to get to this place in his life. But if any of you remember your history, uh, you know it was around that time the Russians invaded Afghanistan. And uh, then President Carter said, I can't in good conscience send our Olympic team uh, to, uh, to the Olympics because they were in Russia. And so he pulled the team out. And Captain Kreider said, I was devastated. He said, I got a call from the president, as, as every athlete did. The president called every single one of the athletes on the United States Olympic team. And he said, he, t- he told him, you know, Steve, I'm, I'm sure sorry. I felt like I needed to do this. It was the right thing to do. And Captain Kreider said, I was polite. I said, I understood. Thank you, sir, for calling. He said, but I was devastated. I didn't know if I was going to make it through that part of my life. He he said, but I was in college, and there was a small group of Christians that came around my life and started to love on me and started to tell me about Jesus and how Jesus could save me. And he said it was through their love uh, and their commitment to me to walk through me, walk with me through those dark days that I became a believer in Jesus. And Captain Kreider said this, if that's what it took for me to become a believer in Jesus, then that's what I would ask God to do all over again. 
Sometimes the unexpected comes into our life and it doesn't ask for permission. A diagnosis that we would rather not have. Financial struggles, all kinds of things can happen to us. And if we're not careful as believers, we can allow those circumstances. If we don't see them in light of who God is and who we are in Christ, we can become bitter about those things. If we're not careful, it can happen. And so we need to just ask the Lord, God, would you help me to see these circumstances like you see these circumstances? Now listen, I don't pretend to know how all of this works, but I believe that I belong to him, and if you're a Christian, you belong to him, that he holds you in the hollow of his hands, and that somehow, some way, I don't know how it all works, but somehow, some way, there's not one thing that comes into my life that doesn't first have to pass through his hands. And we can trust him. We can trust him. Sometimes the unexpected comes, and it doesn't ask for permission. And I'll tell you this, it's often in those times that you and I have to decide, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust my circumstances? Am I going to trust in what I thought was the pathway that I was supposed to go down and now is closed to me? Or am I going to trust in Jesus? And if you'll decide to trust in Jesus in moments like that, there's no telling what God will do and how he'll be able to use you in your life and ministry. You want to be used in significant ways, trust the Lord, especially in the most painful places in your life. Now, practicing doing the unexpected requires faith. you got to trust the Lord. And if, and, if, and if you're willing, he'll use you. He'll use you in significant ways, but it won't happen without him pushing you out of your comfort zone. He's going to lead you to places that you never would have chosen for yourself. I'm just telling you. But if you're willing to go with the Lord and trust Him, He'll use your life to impact eternity. Here's here's an unexpected question as we finish up the message this morning. It's really a prayer. And I share it with you, and I, I don't, I don't, ask you to pray this lightly, but I would ask you to think about this, this question, this prayer, and ask the Lord, and ask yourself, is this something I really want to pray to the Lord? Here, here's the question, you ready? Lord, what do you want me to do with the rest of this one and only life you have given me? Lord, what do you want me to do with the rest of this one and only life that you have have given me. Do you understand what you're praying when you pray a prayer like that? Lord, my life is a blank check. You write in whatever you want to write on it. I am all in for you. My answer in advance is yes, Lord. I don't even need to know what it is in advance. My answer already is to you, yes. Lord, what do you want me to do with the rest of this one and only life that you have given me. Now, I don't know the specifics of what that will include for any of you all uh, in this room. I'm still praying through and trying to work through what it means for me in my life and trying to stay obedient to the Lord for what it means with me in my life. But I know this. I I promise you this. I know it will include you going and reaching people for Jesus and doing whatever it takes to get them to the feet of the Savior. I know it will include that. We don't have to pray about that. Lord, do you want me to go tell people about Jesus? The answer is yes. And why are you asking, the Lord would say. Yes. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get people to the feet of Jesus? So I believe that God wants to use every single person here in significant ways for the sake of his kingdom, for his glory, for the sake of Jesus and his fame and his renown in the world, I believe God wants to use every single one of you, and he will. But you have to answer that question. And you have to be willing to say, Lord, whatever the answer is, I'm I'm all in. My answer is yes. And if you do, God will use your life in significant ways. So what if, what if the Lord, uh, so what if you, you think about this and you say, but Lord, what, what if I fail 
uh, at it. You know, and sometimes we're going to try things for the Lord. And uh, we, we, we on our evangelism team, we try some things. And some things we just think, boy, that was the greatest thing ever. And some things we go, well, that was a good experiment. <laughs> that was a good experiment. We tried it. It didn't work very well. All right. Sometimes that happens. Uh, well, Lord, what, this is risky. Uh, what, what, if, what if I step out and, 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 and I get hurt or, it, or it, it doesn't work out like I thought it would? And it might. It might not work out as you think it should or would. But listen, there's no greater joy than to hear the voice of God and to step out in faith. And to trust him for the results. Nick Ripkin wrote a book called The Insanity of God. And I highly recommend that book to you if you've never read it. Uh, and that, that's not really his name. That's his pen name. Uh, Nick and, and his wife are, were IMB missionaries for a long time. And, and the Lord sent them on a mission through the IMB to, to go and study the persecuted people of the world. And so that book is, is about... His report, really, of, of meeting with people who are uh, living in places that some, sometimes they can't even mention where they're at for fear that they might get back and they would suffer harm or even loss of life. And uh, so, uh, but, but Nick, and he, he's a Kentucky boy, by the way. And I heard him sharing one time about when he and his wife were missionaries in Kenya and they had three sons and one of those sons had asthma. And one night when they were there in Kenya serving, uh, that son had an asthma attack, and, and they were, uh, it was a bad one, and they couldn't get it controlled by regular means, and, and they tried to get him to the nearest hospital, but because the hospital was so far away, uh, he, he, he died. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't save him. And, you know, Nick said if we'd been just about anywhere in the United States, we, we could have got him to a place where he could have been saved, and He'd have been okay, but we weren't there. We were in Kenya. And he said, I, I used to say the, the safest place in the world is in the, the center of God's will, but Nick said, I, I don't say that anymore. I say the best place in the, in the world is in the center of God's will, but it's not the safest place. And brothers and sisters, if we're going to live to do whatever it takes to get people to the feet of Jesus so they can hear him say, Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. We're going to have to step out in faith and ask him to use us, no matter the cost. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the love of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing each one of us and, and calling us your own and giving us a new name, child of God. And Lord, setting us on mission for the sake of your son and his gospel. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would speak into the hearts of every single one of us here in this morning, in this, this chapel service, Lord. Speak clearly, Lord, so that we can hear, and then give us the faith, God, the grace and the faith, Lord, to trust you in whatever it is that you say to us. Lord, as students are preparing uh, in this very pivotal time in their life, sharpening the tools here uh, in this wonderful, godly institution, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would begin to clarify their call, Lord. I pray, God, that you would help them even now, Lord, to begin to take steps uh, that pushes them out of their comfort zones, Lord, and helping them, God, to have the courage to share the gospel message and to do whatever it takes to get their friends, their family, their co-workers, Lord, the people that they meet on a regular basis, Lord, the stranger maybe that they meet along the way, God, that you would give them the courage to share the gospel so that people can have an opportunity to hear the good news and be saved, Lord. I pray that you would set them on fire to that end, Father, with Holy Spirit passion. Lord, would you do that for your glory and for the sake of Jesus? In his powerful name we pray, amen, amen. Thank you all. God bless you.